This is a lens. And this is a lens. And this is a lens. Welcome to the introductory video about optical lenses. The chapter is 37 and we are going to look at this example, this use of refraction as we move forward. To begin with, there are two types of lenses, convex and concave. Hey, I wanted to remind you about one thing about refraction, is that refraction is due to the changing of the speed of the wave as it enters a new medium. And so all the angles, as in everything else in optics, is measure, are measured to the normal. So as we saw with curved mirrors, if the normals aren't parallel, the angles that things the light bends at can change dramatically. Now let's see how refraction occurs in lenses. Let's look at a lens as if it were a set of several matched prisms and blocks of glass arranged in the order shown. Prisms refract incoming parallel rays so they converge to a point. We call this type of lens a converging lens. Note that it is thicker in the middle and thinner at the edges. Convex lenses cause light beams to converge on a point, the focal point. In fact, you can use this focal point to start fires. Even the word focus means fire in Latin. Concave lenses cause light beams to diverge and don't have a focal point. Well, they do, but it's imaginary. You can trace these rays back to where they seem to be coming from, and that's the imaginary focal point. Here's a different arrangement. The middle is thinner than the edges, and it diverges the light. Such a lens is called a diverging lens. Note that the prisms diverge the incident rays in a way that makes them appear to come from a single point in front of the lens. In both converging and diverging lenses, the greatest deviation of rays occurs at the outermost prisms because the angle between the two refracting surfaces is greatest there. No deviation occurs exactly in the middle, for in that region the glass faces are parallel to each other, like light passing through window pane. Real lenses are not made of prisms and are made of solid pieces of glass with surfaces that are often ground to a spherical shape. We see here how smooth lenses refract waves. Sample wavefronts are shown in red. A convex lens can also be used as a magnifying glass. Hey, you pluribusunum! But a concave lens has a magnification of less than one, causing objects to always look smaller. In fact, another way to measure for the focal distance of a concave lens is to look for the point at which the image is half the original object's size. To quickly find the focal distance of a convex lens, you want to look for the point at which the world flips from being upside down to right side up. Find the point, the nonsense point, at which no light is focused and no image is formed. Perhaps the most important use of a convex lens is its ability to project images. Take a look at this. The problem is, these images always appear upside down. Hey look, Roy's Hall. Here are some key features of a converging lens. The principal axis of a lens is the line joining the centers of curvatures of its surfaces. The focal point is the point to which a beam of parallel light, parallel to the principal axis, converges. I show the focal points with purple dots. Incident parallel beams that are not parallel to the principal axis focus at points above or below the focal point. All such possible points make up a focal plane, not shown here. Because a lens has two surfaces, it has two focal points and two focal planes. The focal length of the lens is the distance between the center of the lens and either focal point. So, 
let's take a minute and look at the equations. We have our same relationship between distance of the image, distance of the object, and the focal length. We have our same relationship with magnification here. We do have one new, a couple new equations, one of them being the power of the lens. That normally is only used by eye doctors um, and other people that deal with vision. Um, they talk about the power of a lens, which is one over the focal length. You do have this lens maker's equation. This lens maker's equation is big, a little bit complicated one here, describes how you would decide the focal length of the lens and how you would construct it based on those things. So those are really our only new equations. The simplest use of a converging lens is a magnifying glass. Sydney uses a magnifying glass to examine the structure of a leaf. The leaf is inside the focal length of the magnifying glass so she sees an enlarged upright image. She views the leaf through a wider angle when she views it with a magnifying glass. To understand how it works, think about how you examine objects near and far. With unaided vision, a faraway object is seen through a relatively narrow angle of view and a close object is seen through a wider angle of view. So to magnify something, you need to increase the angle through which you view it. To see the details of a small object like this flower, get close for a wide angle view. If you find that your eye can't focus when too close, a converging lens provides an enlarged right side up image only when the object is inside the focal point, as we see here. If a screen is placed at the image distance, no image appears because no light is directed to the image position. The rays that reach your eye, however, behave as if they came from the image position. We call the result a virtual image. Here the eye sees an enlarged flower, nicely magnified. And, as said before, when the object is beyond the focal point of a converging lens, a real image is formed instead of a virtual image. The real image of the candle is upside down. Real images with a single lens are always upside down. A diverging lens, on the other hand, used alone produces a reduced virtual image. It makes no difference how far or how near the object is. When a diverging lens is used alone, the image is always virtual, right side up, and smaller than the object. Here's a view that shows an object and its image when the object is beyond the focal point of the lens. I show the focal point with the purple dots. We see that the image is upside down. And another view of the same. I place a purple dot where the far focal point is located. Light from the candle flame that travels parallel to the principal axis after refracting through the lens passes through this focal point. Here's the near focal point. Light from the flame that passes through the near focal point after refracting through the lens travels parallel to the principal axis. Where they meet, the image of the flame is formed. And there's no net refraction of light that passes through the center of the lens. Not surprisingly, it contributes to the image of the flame. Yum physics. The same thing happens with the human eye. We're going to be looking at the skeleton using this human eye model. And when it's projected on the back, you'll see what happens. But I'll have to turn off the lights. Don't get scared now. Ah. When light enters the eye, the convex lens focuses it on the retina in the back of the eye. This image is, of course, upside down. You probably have long since forgotten those blurry few months during infancy during which you trained your mind to see properly. The human eye actually contains two lenses, one on the outside and one on the inside. The one on the outside is called the cornea, and you can feel your own cornea by closing an eyelid and putting two fingers over it and looking left and right. That little bubble you feel moving around is the cornea, the outside lens. The lens on the inside of the eye is called simply the lens. And it changes shape based on your focus, whether you're focusing on close objects or far away objects. The lens of the eye is elastic. 
and its curvature can be changed by the ciliary body to focus on a particular object. To focus on a far object, the ciliary body relaxes and pulls the lens flat. To focus on a near object, the ciliary body contracts and the lens becomes more curved. In each case, the images are focused against the retina but are upside down. It is the brain that automatically reverses the image so that we perceive the correct visual image. And this opening here is called the pupil. It can constrict to let in less light on a bright day. But what do you think this will do? The cat eye pupil. How do you think that will affect an image? Here, the image of a light bulb is being produced on the retina of this human eye model. When I insert the cat's eye pupil, the effect is only to dim the image. It does not destroy it. You see, just because I block some of the light that's going through doesn't mean that I destroy the image. On the contrary, the same rays of light still make it through to form the same image in the same place. Take a look at this situation. Here, the eye is unable to focus light from near objects. We say it's far-sighted. An inserted lens of the right focal length corrects this, and the blurry image is made clear. So another thing that we want to look at is this idea, what if we have multiple lenses? And if you have multiple lenses, what happens is the image from the first lens becomes the object for the second lens. This also works if you use a lens with a mirror. Um, so we talked about when we were talking about mirrors that it's impossible to have with a single mirror a negative or a virtual distance to the object. Well, once you have two lenses or a mirror and lenses or just two optical things, you can start to have that negative distance to the object because the image of the first optic becomes the, ob becomes the object for the second optic. Now, with lenses, there can be problems. Because we know the frequency refracts differently based on the substance, we saw that with dispersion, it creates beautiful rainbows, but it causes a problem with lens. We have what's called chromic aberration, which means that each color has a different focal point. So we see all the white light here, but what happens is that white light breaks up into its colors and you can see we have a lot of different focal points here a different one for every color we label those we call what we call the best focus here you can see because you, it's between the violet and the red so sphere, spherical aberrations like chromic are problems with the actual the geometry of the lens because if a lens is spherical you get this varying of focal points. So the light comes in and comes out and you have this whole array of focal points based on the idea that this is circular and you have those normal radiuses. So what you get is you get a circle of least confusion and you also get this parallel axis focal point. Alright, so that's everything about lenses. Uh, I will see you in class.